Well, good morning, Shiloh. Good morning. You know, over the course of the next month and a half, we're going to be gathering around the table. You know, we church folk, we like to gather around the table. We gather around the table for things like meetings. Yes, there are a lot of meetings. And we gather around the table for things like fellowship and Bible studies. And of course, we gather around the table for food, right? We Methodists love food, amen? Amen. Well, we get this on us because Jesus himself loved to gather around the table. And of course, there were Bible studies and discussions and meetings and food. But more often than not, when Jesus was gathered around the table, he told stories. Jesus loved to tell stories. In fact, he told stories all the time that we call parables. Now, what is a parable? Well, a parable is a story with a point. And that's exactly what Jesus was trying to do around the table. He was trying to tell a story with a point, to make a point to the people who were listening to Jesus. And so this morning, I want to invite you to gather around the table, not literally, because you're all not going to fit here, right? But figuratively, gather around the table with me. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Now, Luke is in the New Testament, which that means the second half of your Bible. It's the third gospel, the 15th chapter, and Jesus is talking with a group of Pharisees and teachers of the law. Now, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were the most holy, most faithful, most obedient men on the face of the earth. They were the religious elite, and Jesus is telling the story to them. This is Luke chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 11 and 12. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, we most famously know this story, this parable, as the parable of the prodigal son. Now, that word prodigal is a really churchy word, and for many of us, maybe if you didn't grow up in church, I still think you get this sense when you hear the word prodigal, you think of sin. Why? Well, it's because of this story. Many of us can name prodigals in our lives, or perhaps we've been the prodigal in our lives. And so we get this sense that prodigal is associated with sin. But that's not right. It's not correct. It's not the real definition of prodigal. And yet... We in the church have focused all of our time and attention in Luke 15 on this one story, in particular, this one son, the younger son, the one we call prodigal. Now, if we could kind of split this story into two acts, like in a play, Act 1 and Act 2, well, Act 1 does focus on the younger son, but Act 2 focuses on the elder brother. But Act 1 and the younger son, they get all the press. And so let's tell that story. That there, there was this younger son, and one day he comes to his father and he says, I want my share of the inheritance. Now, to ask for your share of the inheritance is to ask for your parent to be dead. I mean, the father's not dead. An inheritance is something that you only receive when your father dies, and yet this younger son is doing the unthinkable. He's doing something scandalous. He is asking his father for his inheritance. It's as if this younger son is saying, you know what, Dad, I don't want to be at the table. I don't want to be with you. I don't want you. I don't want to be in relationship with you. Dad, what I really just want is your stuff. And so the younger son removes himself from his father's table. Now, this younger son, I mean, I, it's unbelievable that he makes this request, but even more shocking than the request that the younger son makes is the way that the father responds. You see, this father is a first century Jew. And first century Jews, when, they have, when their sons make this request of them, well, they don't respond lightly. In fact, it wasn't, it wasn't um, out of the ordinary for a father to react violently toward his son. To, to physically harm this son who asked for such an awful request. I mean, he, and ba basically, he's saying to his father, I want you to be dead. But even if this father didn't react violently, 
this father with this request would have banished his son from the family, that he would no longer be accepted as a son, that he would be dead to the family. But this father doesn't react that way. Amazingly, shockingly, more scandalous than the son's request is the father's reaction. What does the scripture tell us? He just freely gives him his inheritance. The father freely gives this younger son his inheritance. Do you realize what this cost the father? Remember, he is still alive. And so in order to fulfill that son's request, that prodigal's request, He has to sell his property and his land and divide his land between the two of his sons. Now, land for a Jew is everything. I mean, your land was part of who you were. It was part of your identity. And so when you had to sell your land, you had to sell a part of yourself. And so when this son makes this request... He's asking the father to give up his wealth. He's asking the father to give up his identity. He's asking the father to give up his status in his community. He's asking the father to die. Now, we, with our 21st century mindset, you know, when our kids ask us for something, we just kind of give it to them, whether they're kids or grandkids, especially grandchildren, amen? You know, when they ask for something, here you go, you can have it, right? but not to the people who were listening in Jesus' day. I mean, they would have heard the scandal. They would have heard the shocking request. And they would have been angry. They would have been ready to crucify this younger son. This was awful. You just don't make this kind of request. The story goes on and The Bible tells us that this is Luke chapter 15, verse 13. Not out long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, this far-off place that this younger son travels to is not a Jewish place. It's not a place where he would have been among his people. And he decides to go all Vegas on his stuff, right? Prostitutes and parties and... Who knows what else, right? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Yeah, I mean, that's what this younger son does. And then, shockingly, you know, all of the stuff, all the inheritance and the money and all that runs out. And everybody abandons this younger son, and, and he's left jobless, homeless, really, at the end of his rope. And this younger son, he decides to to hire himself out to a farmer in the surrounding country. And the the farmer gives him a job, and he has to feed pigs. Now, Jews don't feed pigs. Pigs are unclean, right? For a Jew, a pig is an unclean animal, and so they don't raise pigs. They don't eat pigs. They certainly don't feed pigs. And yet, this is how low this young man has become. I mean, he is down in the mud and the muck of the pigs. In fact, what the pigs are eating is so enticing, and if you've ever lived on a farm and seen what pigs eat, there is nothing enticing about it, right? I mean, he is so hungry. He's so desperate. He's at his lowest of lows that he actually thinks about eating what the pigs are eating, and it's at that low point that he thinks about his father. It's at that low point that he has this awakening moment. And this is what he says to himself. This is what the scripture says. When he came to his census, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. And this younger son, he begins to devise a plan. He says to himself, You know what? If I go to my dad, if I just go to him and say to him, Dad, if I can just become one of your hired hands, then maybe, just maybe, my dad will have me back. You see, the son doesn't want to become a son. No, he realized he's given that up. He's dead to his family, and so he doesn't want to become a son. No, he wants to be a hired hand. Why? So that he can pay off his debt. 
he realizes he has an astronomical debt to pay, one-third of his father's property that he has to earn back. And so the son decides to go back to his father, back to his home. You know, so often I think when we hear the story, we have this kind of movie scene in our minds. When at that moment, when the son is in his lowest of lows, that he just stands up from the mud and just races back to his father, right? But you know life isn't that way. I can imagine that that younger son is thinking over and over and over and over again, will my father actually accept me? Will my father actually welcome me back as a servant? Will my father love me ever again? You know, the journey back home for the son probably looked more like this, you know, walking and talking to himself and pumping himself up and saying, you know what, my father's a reasonable man. You know, he's reasonable. I know that he loves me. He loved me at one time. Maybe he can love me again. And instead of racing, he was probably walking and then stopping and turning around and saying, no, it's not going to work. This is not going to work. And then saying, no, no, my father, he loves me. And, you know, back and forth and back and forth. Can you imagine how long it took the son to actually make the journey home? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. It could have been weeks. It could have been months. For all we know, it could have been years. But what we do know is that when that son is within eyeshot, of the father. That means the father was looking for him. When the father can see the son out in the distance, on the end of the road, he runs to his son. Now fathers in the first century, they didn't run. Fathers were patriarchs. That means they were dignified. Children maybe ran, teens maybe ran, but fathers, they didn't run. And yet this father, he picks up the hems of his skirts and he runs undignified to his son. And the Bible tells us that when he gets to his son, he collapses on him and kisses him and welcomes him and loves him just as he is. And this is the part of the story that captures our hearts. This is the part of the story that we remember, that we embrace, that we say, yeah, that's the kind of God that I serve. This is the story of the prodigal son. But here's the problem. This is just act one. There's another act to the story. Remember in the scripture, Luke 15, 11, the story says there was a man and he had how many sons? Two sons, not just one. So there was an elder brother in this story, and Jesus, with act two, is trying to make the point. This is the point of Jesus' story. He's saying that not only was this son lost and brought back into the family, right? But this elder brother is lost as well. How? What do I mean? Well, then, when the father welcomes the younger son back into the, to the feast, to the table, he throws this colossal party for the younger brother. I mean, it is the party of all parties. It's the feast of all feasts. And the father, he would have invited the entire village to attend. And this elder brother, this, this older son, is out in the field, and he's working, and he hears the music, and he, and he hears the dancing, and he hears the celebration, and he thinks, what in the world is going on? And so he asked one of his father's servants, what is all of this? And this is what the servant says to the elder brother. He says, My, he says your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has him back safe and sound. Now, this is a celebration. I mean, this is exciting. The whole farm has erupted. And yet, this is not a celebration for the elder brother. Why? Because as this younger one, 
This younger brother went out and squandered and went all Vegas on his dad's inheritance. This elder one, the elder brother had stayed home. He was the good one, the faithful one. He was the one who was obedient to his dad every single day of his life. And so this wasn't a celebration for the elder brother. And so this elder brother, he refuses to be part of this. He backs away from the table. He says, no, I don't want to be at my father's table. And he refuses to go in. And the father, the father is heartbroken. And just like he goes out to meet the younger son where he was, he goes out to meet the elder brother where he was. And he begs the elder brother, please, please, come in. Now this elder brother, he is hot. He's angry. And he says to his father, you know what, father, this is total crap. I don't want to have anything to do with this. You know, I have been slaving for you my entire life. I have been the good one, the perfect one. Do you realize that I have not been disobedient to you for even a single day? And I didn't get even a goat a goat, let alone the fatted calf, a goat to celebrate with my friends. No, Father, I will not celebrate with this son of yours. He won't even associate himself with him. I will not go in. I refuse to go in. You can imagine that the father is just devastated, and he says to his son, my son, you were always with me. Everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate Because this son, this brother of yours, was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. And that, my friends, is the end of the story. That's it. It's a cliffhanger. Jesus doesn't tell us whether or not the elder brother goes back into the party. He doesn't tell us if the elder brother gets over himself and comes into the feast. He doesn't tell us by some miracle that this elder brother actually pulls himself back to the table and joins the father at the celebration table. No, it just ends. And that is Jesus' point. Remember who Jesus is talking to? He's not talking to the younger brother types, right? He's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The elder brother's in the room. And he's trying to make a point. You know, we in the church, we get that when we ask for our father's inheritance, when we make bad decisions, when we make bad choices, when we go on all Vegas on stuff, that, that that's sin, right? I mean, we get that this younger brother sins, and I believe Jesus is calling this sin. But what we don't understand is that Jesus is calling this sin. That Jesus is calling this brother's good deeds, his good actions, his what the Bible calls righteousness, self-righteousness. That Jesus is calling this sin as well. Why? Go back to the beginning of the story. And this younger brother, when he asked for his father's inheritance, he's saying to the father, I don't want you. I don't want a relationship with you. I just want your stuff, right? Father, I don't want you. I don't want a relationship with you. I just want your goat. I just want your stuff. Church, do you realize more often than not, this is us. We don't want God. We don't want a relationship with God. We just want God's stuff. We want his blessings. We want his resources. We want the status that we get when we become members of the church. I pray to you guys who became members, you don't want the stuff. You want God. You want a relationship with God. You want a relationship with your brothers and sisters. And whether they're younger or elder, that's what you really want from church. Because this, this is what faith is all about. Faith is about having a loving, grace-filled relationship with the Father and welcoming everybody, younger brothers and elder brothers, 
to the table. This is what faith is all about. Do you see why this isn't the parable of the prodigal son? There are two sons. And prodigal doesn't mean sin. No, it means extravagant, over the top, wastefully generous. Well, that's certainly not the elder brother, right? He's not generous with anything. But when we think about it, it's not really the younger son either. He's not the prodigal in the story. When we think about who is generous, who is extravagant, who is over the top, there's only one character in the story who fits that definition of prodigal, and that's the father. It's the father whose love and grace is over the top. It's the father whose love and grace is extravagant. It's the father whose love and grace is just plain wastefully generous. And the father? Well, that's God. Church, do you see that it's our God who's the prodigal? That's why we worship a prodigal God. Let us pray. God, sometimes when we open the Bible, we think we know what we're reading, but then you, like, mess us up. And we read anew your word, and it challenges us, and it changes us, and it makes us realize there's more to your story than meets the eye. God, I guarantee that every single one of us have set in the younger son's seed, and we've set in the elder brother's seed, and we've been all of this in our lives. And yet, in the midst of all of that, we get that you, God, you're the Father. And that your love is wasteful. But that you're willing to waste it on us. God, we pray that we accept your grace and your love. And over the course of the next few weeks, we wrestle out loud with how much this challenges us with how much this goes against our vein of thinking, with how much it messes us up. Jesus, you never stand still for us. And so God, we pray that we walk with you, our God, our prodigal God. We pray this and we claim this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song.